Italian travel, today I'm in Piedmont at Lake Orta, the westernmost among the great pre-alpine lakes, the perfect destination for artists and writers who often set their works here. It's less known compared to the other lakes, but it is as good as the others. Check it out! Orta San Giulio is the main town on Lake Orta, which is named after this beautiful town built on a panoramic promontory, with its sacred mount overlooking the surroundings. This place is a real jewel to discover. Heart of Orta San Giulio is Motta Square, the town's social gathering overlooking the lake, and starting point to reach the St. Giulio Island by boat in few minutes. The current headquarters of the town hall of Orta San Giulio is Villa Bossi, a renovated villa from the 18th century, with a lovely garden overlooking the lake, while the ancient town hall, called Broletto, dates back to 1582. For centuries it was the icon of the legislative and executive power. The old town of Orta San Giulio is a pedestrian zone, crossed by a long street full of shops, restaurants and elegant villas. The pollution problems due to the industrialization of the shores in the early 20th century have been resolved, and today Lake Orta is a living lake again, the favorite of many bathers and fishermen for the beauty and the wealth of its waters, and Orta San Giulio, the pearl of the lake, has become an elegant and romantic holiday destination. Today I'm going to meet up with my friend Alessandra, a local tourist guide who will show me the beauties of Orta San Giulio. This is the House of the Dwarves. It's the oldest house we have on Lake Orta, built in the late 15th century. Do you see the little windows above? They're so small that in the past people said only dwarves could live inside the house. It's actually a private house we can't get in. Look at the architecture. It's made of wood. The three frescoes you see above are from the 17th century. They've been restored. In the middle is the Assumption, the Madonna and Child, and the Annunciation. This is the Twin House. It's from the 1700s. It's a private dwelling. I've never been in, but I was told that it has a beautiful Italian garden. Look at the roof. It's amazing. Those frescoes are allegories made by the Fiamengini brothers. They were artists specialized in frescoes at the end of the 17th century. Alessandra knows this place very well. She tells me that a visit to Orta San Giulio is not complete if we don't go visit its sacred mount, unique panoramic spot and also a charming place full of art. The sacred mount of Orta San Giulio is a devotional complex, built between the 16th and the 17th century, made of 20 chapels built by the greatest artists of that time dedicated to St. Francis of Assisi. Check it out! This is the most beautiful chapel. This is number 13. It represents Carnival in Assisi. There are so many statues. Each person has a specific role in the scene. Look in the center. There is St. Francis of Assisi, who is brought through the streets of Assisi. He is naked. They want to humiliate him. But look there. There is also a child playing with a dog, two boys dressed as women. It's a mask. And there is also a greasy pole. It's carnival in Assisi. But anyway, in the middle, there is a moment of faith. Each chapel tells us an anecdote. 
a moment in the life of St. Francis of Assisi. Of course, they changed from the first at the end of the 16th century that were very rigid and elemental, to the last ones, on the other hand, examples of the Baroque period. It was an indoctrination. Nobody could read nor write, so people would get the meaning of these chapels only looking at the portrayals. about the Franciscan rule, this is the most important chapel. It's exactly the moment when the Pope Innocent III agrees to the Franciscan rule. We are in 1210. Here you can see the Cardinals and St. Francis on his knees. Friedrich Nietzsche described the Sacred Mount of Orta San Giulio one of the most evocative places in the world. In 1882, he spent few hours at the Sacred Mount with Lou Salome, whose charming enchanted them so deeply that they felt really euphoric and lived moments of pure ecstasy. Nietzsche was so enrapted that he fell in love with the young woman, but theirs were no mutual feelings. According to her, it was just a moment of rapture in a spirit of fraternal communion. But that afternoon was a turning point in the philosopher's way of thinking, who, a few weeks later, began to work on one of his most popular books. Thus spoke Zarathustra. Italian travel, I'm on Lake Orta, wandering through the narrow streets of the old town of Orta San Giulio. With me, there is my friend Alessandra, who is showing me the wonders of this place. I'm going to take you to a beautiful place. Let's go to St. Giulio Island. It's the Island of Silence. It's all linked to the cloistered monastery that occupies most of the area of the island. And then I'll tell you a bit of mystery because it's the island of silence, but it's also linked to snakes and the legend of Saint Julio. To snakes? Yes, it was a very scary island. We're talking about the fourth century. You'll have some surprises on the land. So the Saint Julio island became the island of silence. Yes. Because snakes sounds like something darker than silence. Absolutely mysterious. So, we go. Let's take the boat. By boat, in few minutes, we cross this part of the lake from Motta Square to St. Julio Island, a tiny plot of land populated in the Middle Ages and nowadays almost entirely occupied by the Benedictine Monastery of Cloistered Nuns. Right here on St. Julio Island, several novels and the movie La Correspondenza by Giuseppe Tornatore took place. Here's Saint Giulio. He was a priest who escaped the Arian persecutions in the year 390 from Greece and got here on Lake Orta. He saw the Saint Giulio Island and decided to build his hundredth church here. The other 99 he had built elsewhere on his way. No one wanted to take him to the island, so what did he do? He took his cloak, put it on the water, it floated as you see here. He got to the island on his cloak. Exactly. But do you see all those snakes? Which is the pagan icon, if I'm not mistaken. Exactly. Probably on St. Julio Island there was a pagan altar that scared the population. We're talking about the 4th century, therefore a snake was something scary. That's why he's always depicted with the cloak, the cane, and around him the evil that's being killed. 
he was also an exorcist. He destroyed this pagan altar, and then he built the first Christian church in this area. And this is a line of saints. The first on the left is Saint Sebastian. He had been pierced with all these arrows. The second is easy to guess. Um, Saint Rocco. Good. And there's a beautiful Saint James the Great, a Saint Catherine of Alexandria, and above the four scholars of the church. Let's go down to the crypt. So this is the crypt? Yes, or tomb. Until 1697, we had no idea where St. Julia was buried. The researchers completely destroyed the floor. They found a box with some of the remains of St. Julio. Then they excavated and exhumed the crypt and laid out the body of St. Julio as you see it in that beautiful urn made of crystal and silver. This is the place the believers most used. Orta San Giulio is truly a magical place, soaked in history and legends. One of them is right here. Alessandra is taking me to her place. She is Maria Antonietta, the only resident of the island, except for the nuns. This is a house of 1400. In fact, it doesn't go down on the lake, and inside it was the Longobarda fortress. Her shop is stuffed with interesting relics, including an old camera of the late 19th century belonged to her father, and a copy of a map of Orta San Giulio from the 1600s, with the sacred mount and the island. Maria Antonietta has a great passion for bell towers. She tells us how much she enjoyed climbing up the bell tower of the church of the island and ring the bells, specifying that it happened anni fa e chi li fa. The day flew fast, and now it's time to say goodbye to Alessandra. The tourists get back to their hotels, and the streets and squares of Orta San Giulio gradually empty out. But Lake Orta still has something for me. The pollution problems due to the industrialization of the shores in the early 20th century have been resolved, and nowadays Lake Orta is one of the clearest lakes in the pre-alpine mountains. Little by little the sun goes down, and I just can't resist the temptation of a dive. So... Italian travel, keep on following me, see you next time.